In this video, I take on building the world's largest rideable hex pod, Mega Hex, a passion project of mine that has taken up the past year and a half of my life. What started out as a simple three month build turned into a year and a half of failures, breakdowns, and rewrites. Bro, so close. And I think we have to cut our losses with this project. This is why we don't build max flags. Oh. We even made three entirely different videos before scrapping them in favor of this video that you are watching right now. Do I ever have a story for you? It all started when I came across a video of a Princess Auto Excavator which was capable of orienting itself by using the bucket to stand up and maneuver. So what stops more legs lifting more bodies as one giant unit? As I was working on power loader and other hydraulic projects, I was like, this is doable, like we could do this. All right guys, the plan is simple. Weld together six excavators, wire in all the engines, and then program the legs. I think we do it in three months. The first month went great. We partnered with Princess Auto for this project. They provided us with six excavators and an in-store spending budget. Without them, this project wouldn't be possible. When I first envisioned this thing, it was just gonna be a rectangle. Like the plan was literally cut the frames, shove some box tube through it, throw a few welds on. Each leg could just do the exact same motion. The only difference is what time that motion happens at. But then the frame was way too large, it wouldn't fit through the door. The legs were way too close to each other, which made the frame even bigger and even less stable. So we were like, okay, we have to make this a hexagonal frame. And that just brought so many extra complexities. The joints and all the angles had to be super precise. The motion of the legs was no longer gonna be the same between every single leg. Every leg had to have a specific motion profile and that just instantly was like, okay, we're in way over our heads. In SolidWorks, everything lines up perfectly. You get to the real world and honestly, I should have expected this. We started chopping these frames apart, we shoved them in the box tube and then we started laying it out and we're like, what is going on? Like one side is longer than the other and we're like, none of these legs are where they're supposed to be. Obviously they're mass manufactured. So like we should have known this. If the frame is going to be that far out, then like the motion of each leg is going to be completely different. And our stress analysis that we did in SolidWorks is just not going to match up. Like something is going to break. That required us to start chopping the frames apart that were you know, supposed to be used for alignment. We're now being completely cut off and re-welded. And we basically had to tolerance the frames ourselves. We had to make jigs, we had to make like brackets. And it went from like a two day welding job to over a week of just like trying to get this thing perfectly squared up. Once we were ready to start attaching the legs, I was kind of feeling defeated at that point. And I was like, if I've had this many problems already, this thing is gonna be a nightmare. We started attaching the legs and things were actually going pretty well. Like each leg was attaching properly. The spacing was all correct. Everything was moving smoothly. It was looking epic. And I was starting to see what this thing could become. I knew this thing was gonna be large, but actually seeing it in person, this thing is huge. Like this is going really well. We're making progress. We're gonna get to the test relatively soon. What's, what's the feeling like? I mean, a lot of anticipation, a lot of like, please work, please work. Like there's so much riding on this. I had, you know, a lot of doubts. I was like, what if the welds crack? You know, what if the frame is slightly twisted or we have a hose pop off and this whole thing just comes crashing to the ground? Honestly, I told everyone this and I was surprised that anyone even volunteered to step foot onto this thing. Holy crap, all this work is finally paying off. Ow, I fell. You okay? Yeah. So we need some computerized control to be able to make this thing stable. Absolutely. Because right now, it's a little hard to drive with four individual pilots. That was the most scared I've ever been going zero feet. <laughs> well, we know that the system can lift its weight. Let's take a minute to talk about 
on hex pod feet. As you can tell, I've replaced the bucket on this leg with a brand new design of a hexapod foot. The buckets, well, they're great for digging, but unfortunately they don't have great surface contact. With a new design, we have lots of ground contact, have more motion with this cylinder, and it looks way cooler. Ideally, we like to be able to drive the entire thing with just one pilot. To do this, we need a computerized control system. The whole control system starts right here, at the Linux computer. It's responsible for calculating how to move each individual leg based on the user's input. That data is then sent over to our Cunbus Revolution Pi. It's responsible for taking data in and figuring out how to move the legs to the right position. It does this by first calculating the position of each individual joint based on the rope tensiometer. It then compares that value to where each leg needs to be. It then sends signals to our servos to move the valves to their desired positions. Unfortunately, the Kunbus system does not really speak the same language as the servos. It outputs 24 volt signals and the servos require five volt inputs. So we've created a PCB using Altium Designer and got it manufactured by JLC PCB to act as a translator between the Kunbus system and our servos. By the way, you can try Altium for free and get 25% off your purchase with my link below. Ben jumped into this project and began working on the control system and software. As you would imagine, there's a lot of code. In order to test this without needing to use the actual Meg Hex, I'm using simulation. This simulation takes the CAD data from SOLIDWORKS and the hexapod math combines it into one to give us an accurate visual of the Meg Hex. We are feeling confident, perhaps a little too confident, as we are soon to enter integration hell. The design of this project is critical. And just like our other projects, we use SOLIDWORKS. SOLIDWORKS is our favorite sponsor because it is super powerful design software which empowers us to refine our ideas into manufacturable designs and build crazy things like Mega Hex. For the first time ever, SOLIDWORKS is available to you guys as the 3D experience SOLIDWORKS for makers offer. This is actually a huge deal because SOLIDWORKS is one of those industry leading softwares that was normally only available to big companies. But with the makers offer, anyone can get access at a super affordable price of only $99 per year or $9.99 per month. Plus, we have negotiated to get our viewers an extra 20% off if you use my link. This is like getting SOLIDWORKS for 99% off, which is unheard of in our industry. You can get the world's best design tools and turn your ideas into reality or browse the gallery of online models. Join the global community of creative makers today and use my link to get 20% off your subscription. Big thanks to SOLIDWORKS for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get Megahex walking. After countless hours of troubleshooting, we finally have all the hardware and software integrated together for the first test of a Mega Hex leg. As you see behind me is the simulation of Mega Hex walking. The black leg is the real time position of this foot and the transparent legs are where Mega Hex wants to move. So if you can see me moving these potentiometers updates the real time position. So theoretically, once we get this engine started up, the Mega Hex leg should move into the same position as the simulation. And once we give it a command to walk, hopefully we'll have Mega Hex take its first steps. Starting up in three, two. Standing out. Try going like this. Well, it didn't explode and catch on fire, so that's a good start. It looks like it was trying to move, and that's what the simulation was telling us. I just don't think it was trying hard enough. We have a bit of tuning to do on the joints, and We'll see if we can make it a little bit better. I think we need to slow down the simulation. So hopefully it has a better chance of keeping up. I'm trying to figure out what actually I need to do to slow it down the way we are thinking. Add another 50% to the PID values? Yeah. Still not responsive enough. Not on the tibia tarsus of femur. No. Um, Turn them up. Keep... I think the femur is what we need more of right now. I tripled the leg lift height. Ah, it's a lot okay. better. Okay, yep. Okay, double the femur. Heck, just go like three times more. That's walking. So what we're doing is we're turning up all the gains. So it's gonna try about twice as hard as it did last time to try to keep up. The concern with this is if we go too high, the leg will basically rip itself apart because it'll start oscillating. As it sees an error, it'll try to overcompensate for it and basically overshoot and 
that gets worse and worse and worse. I'm gonna do the legs basically going full speed forward, full speed back, full speed forward, full speed back, and doing nothing of what we're trying to get it to do. Bogdan, I, I think I see an issue over here. So the reason we have all of these plots and simulations, everything set up, is so we can diagnose weird issues like this. We start looking through the code, trying to figure out like, what do we change? You know, we revert back to the old code, we run it, still having the same issue, we're like, what is going on? Like, why is this one joint just not moving at all? So all three of these joints seem to be tracking fairly well, except for the femur. I think there might be an issue with the servo. Oh, the freaking servo. Oh yeah, these are toasty. That one, that one on the bottom especially. You have the thermal gun? Yeah. Yeah, Oh yeah, that thing is over 100 degrees Celsius. See, the other ones comparatively are like 60, which is still not great. These windings are supposed to be this bright orange color. That black coil states that this motor is toast. Replacing a single servo would take like three hours. Like, oh great, another servo failed? Well, there goes another week. We obviously know we have to replace all the servos and we have to figure out a solution, which ended up being ch changing different springs. When the bigger spring was installed, every time the servo moves, it has to work on compressing the spring. With the smaller spring, the servo's not gonna be working nearly as hard, therefore generating less heat. The second thing I did was I added this computer fan to keep some fresh air moving across the servos to keep them all just a little bit cooler. And with different springs, all of the tuning we'd done that week was just out the door, completely useless. And that was just like a huge hit to our progress. <laughs> with testing this whole thing, I was starting up that engine and stopping at every like 10 minutes. So we're like, all right, we need new engines that have a remote start, but also were a little bit more powerful, which meant we can use bigger pumps and get a lot more flow, hopefully increasing our speed and power on all the joints. So we spent like two weeks just like pulling all the old engines off, pulling all the old pumps off, undoing all of our hydraulic. Luckily, mostly everything was, you know, dropping replacements but it was still a lot of work to rewire all the engine starters together, rewire all the stops together. We had to add that to our emergency stop system so it would actually shut all the engines off. And that was a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, the exhaust, honestly, we could have probably gotten away without it, but even just having one engine running and trying to like get a vent over top of it while we were testing was just really annoying. And I was like, there's six of these things. Not only is it gonna be crazy loud, like right around me, but also it just smelled terrible. And I was really worried about my health or anyone else who was gonna be near this thing. I got Mike to actually take some time and plumb in some proper exhausts, uh, as well as some proper baffles, quiet the whole thing down and, you know, exhaust it out of the back so it's not blowing into my face. At this point it was like five months in, like two months over the estimated timeline. We still have not seen a single proper stand-up test with all the new engines and the, the new pumps that we had to get and the replacement servos that you know didn't burn out, the new springs, the budget was just like, we spent the entire sponsor budget in the first like three months. And now we're just like, this is coming out of our pockets. This was the day, actually not the first day. Um, we tried it the first day and then some of our engines weren't firing up. We tried it the second day, we're getting hydraulic leaks. Try to the third day, our, some of our sensors were misreading values. So we're gonna fire up all six engines and see if uh, the platform will rise to the air. Now it stood up with manual control. This it is did. without people on it. This is without people on it, fully computerized control. So we should be able to just hit a single button and the whole thing should rise more or less evenly off the ground. Safely, right? Yeah. As long as there's no one near it, it should, should be okay. <laughs> Firing up! Try to stand this whole thing up and at first it's like going well and this whole thing like five feet in the air starts curling up like a dying spider me and ben are just like looking at each other being like are you doing this like i don't have the controller i'm not doing this and so like i slam on the e-stop and we're both like confused as hell we're like how do we fix that <laughs> <laughs> um, when i undo e-stop 
it's gonna do something. Dropping. Uh, might have had a program crash or something. It could have been any number of things. It could have been hydraulic issues, it could have been software issues, it could have been electrical issues, it could have just been, you know, mechanical issues with the valve getting stuck or something. Luckily, we look over all the data and it turned out just to be a simple code change. Our leg was actually trying to go past its limit. Two lines of code, uploaded again, ran the system. Restarting. And this thing just perfectly rose into the air. Yeah! Standing, we got it. All the legs on the ground. It was a sight to behold. And the legs lifted up and moved around. So we're like, okay, we're on the right track. We need to figure out how to get this thing outside because there is no room in the shop to test it. We spent the last eight months or something working on this, and now we're just dragging it out of the concrete. We were obviously optimistic because the simulations were working. Starting robot. And like this thing just like barely lifts its foot up, just like drags it across the ground and just like slowly stumbles over, just like dropping the weight onto every single leg. The ones that there's a lot of load on them, they're not really moving. It brings the leg over, but it doesn't actually have that much force to actually push its own body forward. But overall, it's not on fire and we didn't break anything, I don't think. So good first test. And we're looking at this data, we're looking at this thing walk. We changed a lot of tuning values. We changed the way it's gonna to try to walk. And every test following that, we'd spend a day dragging this thing out. It would like stand up, take two steps, one leg would fumble or the position would be off. The whole thing would just tip, damage something. It was just so frustrating. It was, it was really upsetting just to see this thing slowly damage itself more and more. Yeah, Bogdan, we left some paint behind. We wore it all the way. We just lost our alternator. Ugh. Do we have enough fluid in the reservoir? We got our dead leg. Why are we having issues all of a sudden? Should I just bump the starting threshold up a little bit? The issue of it dropping as it's taking steps has gotten a lot worse. Cut it, cut it, cut it, cut it. That yeah. sensor's gone. Yeah. I don't think it's going. We haven't changed anything. One more try. So now, why are the servos, their legs aren't moving up now. I think we've killed the starter on this motor right here. It's at a regular interval. Oh yeah, we f***ed that wheel off. Break them in yeah, half a second. I agree. We're just We're so f***ing close. Everything is set up right now to work. And now the engines are being problematic. It's ready, it's good to go. We've got everything, it's tuned. Six legs are working. The efficiency of the testing, it's not like, oh, make a simple code change, run it again. Make a simple code change, run it again. No, like if something goes wrong, if one sensor fails, you spend a week fixing it, drag it back out. Oh. You know that right now, our uh, femur, which is our main lifting cylinder, doesn't have enough power when we're lifting three legs at a time. So what's happening is when we're giving flow to other cylinders, it's slowly dropping. So after two or three steps, the actual frame, which was four or five feet above the ground, is now basically touching the ground. So we want to make sure that when it's taking steps, it's got enough pressure and it's got enough flow to sustain that height. Daryl, take a look at this data. Um, all right, all right. Um, if you want to zoom in or whatever, take a look. Okay, based off of that spot right there. Yeah. Um, just gonna need a little bit more work. Right there? Yeah. Awesome. And by work, would you be able to narrow that down at all as to what? <laughs> Probably should be done in a couple of days. I, I, I think. I think I know exactly what he means. A couple days, maybe. Yeah. The femur needs more work. Like, 100%, 100%, yeah. that's what I it was gonna say. It needs more displacement over time. That's what I was gonna say, yeah. femur. 100%, oh, we just need to double it then. Double it. So whatever, whatever the screw is set to on the pressure thing, just double it. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it's called the pressure relief. If we just turn it a little bit, should make Mega Hex walk better. Still not perfect, but it is definitely a lot better. When we're seeing it walk backwards, the body was not dropping nearly as much as it used to. 
and we didn't blow off any hydraulic lines, which is really good too. <laughs> so, kind of want to ride it. Ooh. How serious are you about that buggy? Am I good to ride it? Yeah, I think Anybody you need to give any last words to? Uh, I don't think this thing will kill me. Worst case scenario, just like mild injuries. Love the curve, love the curve. Boy, was he wrong! <laughs> First, like rise up off the ground like when you're all the way up high it feels really satisfying when it starts dropping off it it really loses a lot but honestly the ride is smoother than I expected like we need to max out all the motions yeah. I think we need to increase that step over distance definitely yeah because um, when it's loaded it's not moving very much and it's slipping a lot if we can get the legs off the ground for sure it'll walk so much better see let's, let's bring it back inside for now lucky for us Princess Auto sold other sizes of hydraulic cylinders which were almost perfect drop-in replacements we decided to try smaller cylinders on the tibia and larger cylinders on the femur. We made the cylinder bigger because this joint was lifting a majority of the weight of the mega hacks and it wasn't quite standing up with a slightly smaller cylinder. And who came up with the solution? My grandfather, six months ago. <laughs> I'm not kidding. So Bogdan, how many, do you know how many days it's been they've been working on this project? Hey Daryl, yeah. you know how many days I wanted to punch you in the face? <laughs> Cool. We sprung a leak. We killed the cylinder. Well, that answered that question very quickly. Covered the whole thing in hydraulic fluid. Oh, my laptop. After a spectacular cylinder explosion on the tibia, we had to change those ones back. But the femur cylinders, they worked. Get back out there the next day, try it out again. Every test that we ran, it was walking just a little bit better, just a little bit better, just a little bit better. And like the only thing that kept us going was that we were seeing consistent improvement. Look at how much better that's walking. That is walking a lot better. We could see, we were like, oh, maybe if we just change this one more thing, like next test is gonna work, next test is gonna work, next test is gonna work. And we're like months into testing and making marginal improvements, but it was, it was like almost there, almost there. We've upgraded our feed lines from the pumps to make sure we can get the full flow that the pumps can provide without a loss in pressure. We changed over the step over distance, so how far it's moving. We changed how fast it's moving. There's a lot of changes, so we're expecting this not to work, but it kind of gives us a better idea of what changes have what effect. Finally, we get this thing powered up. At this point, we have like no hopes. So we're like, all right, one more test. Let's just go for it and it took one step, and it took the next step, and it took the next step. Three steps in a row, like this is a good start, like keep going, keep going. And it just kept going and going. The platform was staying above the ground. No nothing was failing, like all the sensors were reading properly, and just like one step after the next. And there was, there was mud all over the ground, and it was just like splashing in the mud. Like yes, like, this thing just walked across the entire parking lot. We were so, so excited. It's like, all right, like turn this thing around, bring it back around. It turns so well though. And this thing starts turning around and we lose communication with the controller. And the thing just like steps on our trailer and we're like, oh. I'm feeling the bet that we lost communications with the controller. One of our wires ended up coming unplugged, but like we knew that like, okay, this thing is working. We had a couple of YouTuber friends come over. I think it was Jake Laser, Nigel from Nile Red, and Ellen uh, Pan. I think as long as we keep the fatalities to under three, we're doing pretty good. Driving around the power loader, having fun. I looked at Ben and I'm like, do you want to drag this thing outside and like get to show it off to them? We power this thing up and just, just like the last test, we just gave her the forward command. I think they were blown away. Here we go! Get up! Rip the lift from them! 
following week later, we just got to work and it, there was just fog across the entire facility. We dragged it all the way out to our field, super cool. We walked around the dirt, you know, threw up some of our lawn, the power loader in the corner, stepping the pumpkin, the fog in the background. Like, and then I'm walking, I'm, I'm turning, I'm turning, and then just out of nowhere, like the side drop. Like, what is going on? I get ready to hit the e-stop. And I look over and the leg is like completely not attached to Mega Hex. And I'm like, I could not believe my eyes. The thing is, these excavators, like, we were pushing these things way past the limits. I'm surprised they didn't fail earlier, to be completely honest. But yeah, like, the excavator frame just completely tore itself in half. Oh, f <laughs> No! This is why companies go bankrupt when they build mechs. I'd probably have a better return on investment making a video where we dig a big hole put a bunch of cash inside and light it on fire. Brought it back into the shop, got the whole thing welded. Next day, we take it back outside, ready to do another test. And same leg, different spot. Crash into the ground again. I go over to look and the frame is just twisted and torn in half. Oh, that's good and bugger. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and it ripped up the other side too. Like this was a main part of the frame. This was gonna require chopping the frame again, realigning everything, new bushings, new body tubes, welding all around, new gusset supports. This was probably another two weeks to fix. And like I looked at this and I'm like, honestly guys, I think this might be the, like the last test for this thing. Yeah. Like. <sighs> all right, well, for better or for worse, I, we're done filming Mega Hex frame that the leg is connected to and is now just ripped in half. So a single wire corroding, a single connection going bad could take days to diagnose. And I think we have to cut our losses with this project because at this point it's, it's diminishing returns. This is why we don't build max legs. There was no way that we could keep just allocating so much time and so much money to this project just to have it, you know, take five steps and another thing breaks. You know, we got our goal, it was walking. That was our goal, we reached it, and honestly, it was time to call it a day. You know what, without the support of you guys and making continuous videos, there was no way that this was gonna be sustainable. Like, this project was so much time, so much effort, so many different learning opportunities, but really, like, completely honestly with you, we really should not have greenlit this project. This project should not have happened. It was way more complicated than we anticipated. We had way more issues than we thought. The, the timing and the difficulty was just way underestimated. And literally the only thing that kept us going was you guys. Every one of these failures was content. It was gonna teach us something, it was gonna teach you something. And we really hope that that comes across on video. This project is the reason we haven't been able to post as often as we normally would. And to make sure we show this journey in the best way possible, we initially edited a three-part video series, but we felt like it didn't tell the whole story. We do think there's a lot of interesting detail in those videos, and so we've made each of those videos available to our members. I do not know if we're gonna ever be able to do another project like this again. If you'd like to see us try something like this again, and hopefully do so without coming near bankruptcy, please, please, just subscribe, like this video, share it to anyone else who you think would be interested, and consider becoming a member because this was really expensive, not just in terms of parts costs, but the amount of labor that went into this, all the engineering time, all the after work hours, we could not have done it without the support of our members. So thank you so much for watching this video. Thank you so much for your support. And hopefully we'll see you guys back here with uh, some other cool projects in the near future.